My name is Carol Phillips, and I am going to read um, the title of the session, uh, A View of the Empire at Sunset. Oh, Arlo, wherever you are, thank you. And thank you to everybody at the Key West Literary Seminar. I just echo what everybody has said, the hospitality, the organization, um, the generosity has been tremendous, so thank you. Um, a View of the Empire at Sunset is the title of a novel uh, that will be published in May. Um, and it concerns, amongst other things, the life of a woman called um, Ella Gwendolyn Reese Williams, who is probably better known to readers as Jean Reese. Um, Jean Reese was born in 1890 in Dominica and died in 1979 in England. She migrated to England as a 16-year-old girl from Dominica. And she endured a pretty difficult and tempestuous life in Edwardian England and then thereafter in the Paris of the 1920s. She was a chorus girl on stage. She suffered a great deal of poverty. Um, she was exploited in many different ways. She was a prostitute for a time. She was an alcoholic for most of her life. But in the 1920s, she emerged as one of, I think, one of the finest writers of English prose in the 20th century. She only went back to Dominica once after she left at 16. Her second husband, a man called Leslie Tilden Smith, who was a literary agent, in 1936 um, purchased tickets to go on a boat called the SS Cuba um, from England, first to St. Lucia and then to Dominica. A whole life in England up until that age, she was 46 at that time, had been lived with the idea that if only she could get back to the Caribbean, it would somehow repair the emotional and psychological damage that had been visited on, on her during her years in England and France. We don't really know much about what happened during the six weeks that she and her husband went back to Dominica, but we do know that when they left, to go back to England, she never again set foot in the Caribbean, and she had very negative feelings about the Caribbean. Now, because we don't really know what happened in that six weeks, um, that's good fertile ground <laughs> for a novelist. I mean, there is a problem with Jean Rees in that so much of her work is autobiographical. She wrote an autobiography. There's a huge collection of her letters. So if you're going to try and write fiction which is in conversation with her work, with her life, uh, there is a difficulty of overcoming um, the tremendous preponderance of evidence of her own words. Um, but there is this six-week period when she was 46 years old when she did go back to the place that she loved um, and it didn't quite work out the way she hoped. The novel is um, in 65 sections. Um, I'm just going to read four of them, um, which are towards the end of the novel. I'm going to read sections 56, 57, 58, and 59, which concern the boat nearing the Caribbean. She's had a very difficult passage. She had a very strained relationship with her husband, a very lonely and isolated marriage. Um, the passages also concern the arrival in the Caribbean after all these years away, and then her feelings of total despair um, beginning to overwhelm her as she re-enters um, or tries to re-enter a Caribbean state of mind. Fifty-six, other women. This morning, there are two other women sitting out on deck. She said a polite good morning to them both as she took up her seat, but she received only the briefest of smiles in response. 
the bird-like younger one with plucked eyebrows who is dressed in a navy blue twin set is easy to sum up. No doubt she's returning to the islands to continue to help her husband manage an estate after perhaps visiting relatives or even a child who has been shipped off to a minor public school in the English countryside. The matronly woman is older, closer to her own age and perhaps not yet 50, although the muscles on this woman's face have slackened dramatically. She reads an out-of-date newspaper like a man, with the sheet spread out and occupying her full wingspan. But there is plenty of room on deck, so why not? Occasionally, she leans forward, and she licks a finger to make turning the pages a little easier. And her guess is that the woman is a schoolteacher of some description, for her shoes seem more functional than fashionable. And lying on the seat next to her is a briefcase. She's noticed that women today no longer seem to feel the need to justify or even explain why they exist independently of men. Progress, she assumes, and a part of her envies such modern women. But are they any happy, happier? Do they truly know what to do with this freedom? She wonders, is a stern-looking woman sitting opposite her with a man's briefcase on the neighboring chair really what the suffragettes were dreaming of when they chained themselves to railings and threw themselves beneath the feet of galloping horses. 57, the bluest sea. The school teacher has neatly folded the newspaper and slipped it into a briefcase. She didn't even offer to share it with her and give her the opportunity to catch up on the news. Now, both the sensibly shod school teacher and her twin-suited friend are blissfully dozing. Their heads occasionally snap into attention before they once again readjust their positions and fall back asleep. She recognizes that her quandary with Leslie might best be described as unhappy, but not desperate. And she realizes that there is a difference. In the distance, she hears a clap of thunder which wakes the school teacher but leaves the younger woman still dreaming. The older woman looks around as though momentarily unsure of where she is, and then the rain cloud bursts and the torrent begins. The woman leans back in her chair and proceeds to try once again to rest. They are, all three of them, seated beneath the bridge, so unless a strong wind begins to blow, they will remain dry. But what to do now? Really, the woman might have offered to share her newspaper. She looks again at the sleeping school teacher, and from her pocket she draws a violet headscarf and fastens it tightly about her head, although the odd shred of hair insists on breaking cover and flying free in the stiff breeze. My husband and I no longer enjoy any intimacy. So this is my situation. I don't anticipate your sympathy, nor do I wish to receive your judgment. I'm sorry, but I say this just to clear the air. Given the fact that they will presently be approaching the tropics, she wonders if at some point soon the school teacher is perhaps contemplating a change in travel costume from heavy tweed to light cottons. You see, my husband hasn't done me any actual wrong that I can identify. If anything, Mr. Leslie Tilden Smith has been too devoted, and not infrequently he's left me feeling claustrophobic and angry, and I've lashed out. People say that time heals, but it doesn't. You just train yourself to forget the ugly incidents, but it only takes one thing to bring it all back again. In fact, the only thing you really learn is how to forget temporarily. You see, my husband miscast me. Sadly, these days, my Leslie's thoughts about me are difficult to discern, for they are well hidden behind a mask of diligent formality. Unfortunately, I fear that I may have robbed him of the capacity for happiness. 
But she says none of this and turns from the slumbering woman and stares now at a suddenly deep blue Caribbean sea that rises and falls under a stormy sky. 58, home. From the deck of the SS Cuba, she gazed at the densely textured slopes of the St. Lucia Hills. They were thickly matted with foliage which exhausted every possible shade of green and capped by an azure cloudless sky and she breathed out with relief for she was home. They would remain here for a few days before taking a smaller vessel that would convey them north to Dominica and her reconnection to a world that she hoped would lift the burden of anonymity from her tired shoulders. She looked at the lush island landscape and she journeyed back in her mind to her childhood. She remembered her mother busying herself in the living room, rearranging her father's books and newspapers, or meticulously draping the polished table in a lace cloth, which always seemed to remain stubbornly decorated with a lattice of stiff folds. She also remembered her mother seated squarely in her bedroom before the looking glass and staring fixedly as though unable to see her own reflection. As the years passed by, she began to notice that her mother was becoming progressively more careless about polishing her nails and increasingly disinclined to trouble herself with the task of rouging her lips. She remembered her father whose distrust of the English she now understood. But over the years, she had trained herself to exercise caution once her father made an appearance, for his loss had plunged her into a state of despair from which she knew she had never truly recovered. As the SS Cuba edged its way into the crescent of the harbor, she fought hard to banish her father from her thoughts, for she had no desire to temper the elation of her arrival with the sorrowful affliction of grief. When she and her heavily perspiring husband finally arrived at their Castries guest house, they were met by an Englishwoman who appeared to be in charge. Although she had some distant memory of the small property being owned by a second or third cousin on her mother's side. Mrs. Ellis's face was heavily enameled, which she presumed made it difficult for the strange looking lady to express any emotion other than mild discomfort. But they dutifully followed the proprietress up a narrow wooden staircase, and they listened to the woman's sing-song voice as she apologetically recited the list of rules. Having run a finger along the top of the dresser to demonstrate the absence of dust, the woman untied a single key from a small assortment that she carried on a long ribbon around her neck and then handed it to Leslie, closed in the door and left the newly arrived couple in peace. She sat in silence for some moments on the side of the overly quilted twin bed before forcing herself to her feet. She glanced at her husband, who had slipped off his shoes and was spread-eagled across the coverlet, and then she decided to go out onto the balcony. Down below, on a small outcrop of rocks overlooking the wide expanse of the harbor, she saw a young negress standing by herself and pressing a headscarf to her hair, as though worried that a sudden flurry might at any moment strip it from her. Her husband soon joined her on the balcony, but neither of them said anything as they peered down on the woman who stared blankly at the sea. After a short interval, Leslie retreated back into their room, leaving her alone, and she, in turn, took up a seat on a small metal chair. Two hours later, the bright afternoon glare began to fade, and the day offered no resistance to the upsurge of night. 
After a restless first night in the lumpy bed, she woke suddenly to a blade of light streaming into the room. It was still dark, however, and she realized that the intrusive glow was from a street lamp that was situated just below their room. She had no inclination to disturb her husband, so she lay quietly and waited to be greeted by the noises of a West Indian day. To begin with, she heard the rattling of carts in the street, then the shrieking of seagulls wheeling in the ill-defined border between sea and land, and then the more boisterous and intrusive noises of the cook beginning to busy herself in the small yard to the side of the establishment. The woman would no doubt be preparing breakfast for the two guests from England, who she had most likely been told would expect to be treated regally. A sluggish-looking Leslie opened his eyes, as though unsure of where exactly he was, and she took this as her cue to leave the bed and put on a dressing gown. Since their arrival, there had been no conversation of any substance between them, and it was difficult to determine if her husband was excited or disappointed. No doubt, once he discovered his bearings, he would have something to say, but in the meantime, she was grateful that he appeared to be allowing her time to re-enter her world in peace. She stepped out onto the balcony and looked down at the beach where she saw a man riding a horse at a full gallop along the line where the sea was breaking in a flat, hushed whisper. With each hoofbeat, a small shower of brine exploded and animated the otherwise tranquil scene. She imagined the hunch rider being stirred by both the snorting and wheezing of the animal and the roar of the wind in his ears, and she felt sure that the thunder of each stride would be rattling his every bone. But from her own distant vantage point, there was a mute, silken grace to the movement of man and horse. As it transpired, she spent the greater part of the day nursing Leslie, who directly after breakfast succumbed to diarrhea, which forced him to remain confined to their room. It had been clear to her that the bacon was overcooked, and she'd avoided it, fearing a failed attempt by the cook to compensate for the lack of any cold storage. But Leslie had eaten a hearty helping. Whilst her husband tossed and turned, looking as though he might at any moment wilt in the heat and humidity, she was able to lightly doze in the wicker chair that was set in the shade away from the window and accustom herself to the heavy thickness of the air. By late afternoon, Leslie had recovered sufficiently to be able to contemplate joining her for dinner, and she was relieved to see an untroubled ease to his gait as he made his way downstairs to the dining room. After dinner, they accepted Mrs. Ellis's offer to join her in the parlor and listened to Mr. Ellis playing the piano. As Mrs. Ellis introduced them to her mild-mannered husband, she instantly surmised that Mr. Ellis was the type of Englishman who in the privacy of his own home would habitually soak his feet in a basin of hot water and each night place his teeth in a glass. <laughs> the man's dark eyebrows almost met and his slightly slack-jawed mouth was disturbingly overcrowded with his ill-fitting dentures. The proprietress informed her guests that when they lived in Kent, her husband used to provide the accompaniment to the silent pictures at the cinema but tonight, she and Mr. Tilden Smith would constitute his audience. Mr. Ellis proposed playing for them a selection of classical and popular favorites, although Mrs. Ellis quickly interrupted and warned them that her husband drew the line at German music, which had never had any place in his repertoire. Mrs. Ellis must have warmed to her guests, for before the onset of the recital, 
the woman offered them a specially imported blend of over-perfumed tea and a plate of sliced fruitcake, all served on what was clearly her best china. An hour later, Mr. Ellis concluded his presentation, but he remained seated at the piano, his dull, hooded eyes wide open as he continued to stare at the keys where his fingers remained poised. It was then that she noticed that Mr. Ellis was wearing brown carpet slippers with ill-matching socks, one gray and one black. And in an instant, she understood the Ellis's story to be one of difficulty and struggle. Mr. Ellis continued to wait, but for what it was impossible for her to divine. Mrs. Ellis, on the other hand, seemed completely unperturbed by the melancholy stupor into which her husband appeared to have fallen, and she stood and in one fluid movement picked up the tray of tea and the untouched cake. With this done, she shuffled her way out of the room and closed the door behind her. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Ellis appeared to return to the world. Standing up from his piano stool, he padded his way to the drinks cabinet, inside of which was gathered a small nest of glasses and a bottle of sherry. He quietly poured two neat measures, which he handed to his guests, commenting that it helped with the cold on a dark night. With this done, he poured himself an allowance and then sat opposite them both. And it was impossible for her to tell, it was possible for her to discern that the man's eyes were now damp with emotion. As Mr. Ellis lifted the glass to his lips, she understood that he would say no more. A few minutes later, Mrs. Ellis re-entered the room and looked tenderly at her tranquil husband and simply said, it's time, Alfred. At which point the man rose to his feet and diligently replaced the empty but unwashed glass in the cabinet. He then positioned himself by his wife's side, but he continued to look much affected, as though he'd suffered some great loss. Good night, said Mrs. Ellis, offering them both the briefest glimpse of a smile. Perhaps you'd be so kind as to turn out the lights when you retire. Once upstairs, she put on a cardigan and then opened the door to the balcony and took her glass of sherry with her out into the cool night air. The salty smell of the sea stung her nose with a sharpness that she'd not noticed during the daytime, but she decided to remain outside until her husband had fallen asleep. It occurred to her that Mr. Ellis most likely felt obliged to obey his wife, for it was probably Mrs. Ellis's money, a bequest perhaps, that had enabled them to travel out to the West Indies. There was no doubt that it was her fierce energy that kept the hotel running smoothly, for Mr. Ellis appeared to be incapable of rising to meet such responsibilities. She conjectured that Mr. Ellis's dreams of a life in music, giving recitals, composing melodies, had been unhappily shipwrecked on the rocky shore of his wife's practical common sense. Over dinner, the woman had, after all, shared a little of their history with her guests. Alfred's doctor insisted that he wouldn't last another winter in England. So I said, for heaven's sake, let's find some sun. Out on the small balcony, a shiver ran through her as the wind rose, and she wondered if she'd correctly intuited the source of sadness that hovered over the lives of Mr. and Mrs. Ellis. 59, and now, empty world. In the morning, she found herself wide awake and listening to the monotony of Leslie's light snoring while it was still dark outside. All night, her memory had rushed crazily, 
and it was her mother who seemed to feature at every turn until finally she looked into the woman's dim eyes and asked for forgiveness. But her mother seemed puzzled and assured her that she had done nothing for which she needed to be forgiven. And then she woke suddenly as though a blanket had been torn away and she blinked hard and eventually she realized where she was. The prospect of a sleepy early morning exchange with Leslie seemed too awkward to consider. So she dressed quietly and left their shared bedroom. She tiptoed down the stairs and stepped into her shoes at the front door, taking particular care not to disturb the small table which supported Mrs. Ellis's delicately balanced vase of poinsettias. Once outside, the cloying density of the night air and the strong chorus of palpitating insect life let her know that dawn remained some way off. But her mind was made up. She moved purposefully through the silent streets and in the direction of the small outcrop of rocks overlooking the harbor where she intended to station herself so that in an hour or two, as the listless waves continued to lap, she might witness the full glory of the sun rising over her now empty world. Thank you. Please wait for the microphone and stand. Am I supposed to say, if there are any questions, I will take them? <laughs> I just said it. <laughs> and if there's not, that's also perfectly fine. That was beautiful. Are you sure we can't get the book today? Sorry? That I was didn't... wonderful. I'm just saying. I guess we can't get the book today. Um, my publisher's sitting here somewhere. <laughs> no, you can't. Because, no, sorry. I wish. I'm the sit. Kaz, I'm the publisher, but I wanted to ask you if you feel how, you, how you're channeling Jean Rhys in the book, in the style of the book. Could you talk about that? Sorry, John, and how am I? Channeling right. Jean Rhys in the book. Oh, well, I mean, the hardest thing with any, I mean, this is just peculiar to me, perhaps, but the hardest thing writing any type of fiction is to find the voice. Um, is to find the first person singular. Even if the novel is not going to be narrated in the first person singular, I still have to have familiarity with the first person singular because there's a, probably a strong possibility there'll be dialogue at the very least. <laughs> so um, it's very hard to find the voice of Jean Rhys because this, her voice is so ubiquitous in her own work. There are many interviews. There's um, documentaries about her. So they had, there came a point where I had to stop reading her, where I had to stop um, doing the thing that we waste a tremendous amount of time doing as writers, research, you know, because, you know, research is fun, um, but it can waste a lot of time. Uh, so I had to unlearn her voice if you, if, in, a, in a rather peculiar way. I had to stop being familiar with her voice. Um, in order to find her voice. And then as I was saying at the beginning, um, I think without this six week period, I don't think I would have wanted to write about her because she is so overly um, analyzed. I mean, aside from anything else, I mean, she, there are, she is one of those writers who have, have found themselves becoming what William Golding 
called, you know, the raw material for a light academic industry. Um, so, and, you know, countless dissertations, essays, conferences. So I had to switch that off for uh, at least a couple of years to find my own Gene Reese, if you like. Uh, the one thing that I will say is that um, I, knew, I knew about Derek's poem, Gene Reese, which is a brilliant poem. But I, I didn't really know that Olive Seney had al also written about Gene Reese. Lorna Goodison had written about Gene Reese. The extent to which Caribbean writers have affection for this Caribbean writer uh, was very humbling, very humbling to realize that so many people um, that I admire had written about her. I felt mo moved to write about her. I think it's partly the way in which her life has been co-opted as a sort of exotic adjunct to English literature or to writings about modernism without any real serious consideration of the fact that if you live somewhere till you're 16, you learn to read there, you learn to write there, you first express yourself there, you become aware of yourself as a, as a fully conscious thinking human being. That is where you're from. You know, that's, that's your world. So much work has been done on Jean Rees which just doesn't take into consideration any notion of her as a Caribbean person. And the first major biography written about her by Carol Angier, as well, you and I have talked about this, it's a 600-page book about Jean Rees's life. Um, uh, the, the biographer didn't even go to Dominica, didn't even consider it worthwhile going to the Caribbean. So I think so many Caribbean writers feel an affection for her for a number of reasons, but, um, you know, a, a, a repositioning of her within the context of those islands is, I think, very important. We have, we have time for one more question. So I was quite taken by your style, and you created a feeling using, to me at least, sort of that inquiring detail and a cadence with that inquiring detail that, that creates a languor. And this is the kind of languor that I find hides in the shadows of the islands of this area. And I wondered if that is something that you consciously did or whether that's something that just comes from the roots. Well, thank you. Uh, the, the, you know, a lot of the book um, takes place in London, in Edwardian London and in Paris. And it necessarily has a different rhythm. The sections I read to you have what you describe as that languor, perhaps because we're re-entering the Caribbean world. So the prose style changes to reflect that languor, to reflect the heat, the heaviness, um, the shorter days, you know. So the prose style has to change. I mean, I, I couldn't write about England with that particular prosodic rhythm. Um, I couldn't write about the fervor of Piccadilly Cir Circus. Uh, so it changes depending on where we are. It just so happens that the, the short sections I've just read to you um, have that rhythm because of the location, because of the geography. Okay, thank you.